great joy for us to have Achan Chandasiri join us for this evening proceedings. Um, I see we have quite a high number of people and I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with um, Ashan Chandra Siri, so I'll just um, mention a few things about her. She was born in Scotland uh, in 1947 and was brought up as a Christian. After university, she trained and worked as an occupational therapist, mainly in the field of mental illness. In 1977, uh, an interest in meditation led her to meet Ajahn Sumedha, and uh, as long for Sumedha, shortly after his arrival from Thailand where he had trained under Achan Cha for over 10 years. Inspired by his teachings and example, he, she began her monastic training at Chithas as one of the first four Anagarikas. That's basically a, a Buddhist novice, female novice. Within the monastic community, she has uh, been actively involved in the evolution of the nuns' Vinaya training, trained in code for nuns. She has guided many meditation retreats for lay people, uh, not only in England, but in Europe as well, and particularly enjoys teaching young people and participating in Christian Buddhist dialogue. Five years ago, in 2015, uh, Achen Chandasiri established Milton Tuin Hermitage uh, in Scotland, about an hour's drive, hour and a half's drive uh, in Perthshire, north of Edinburgh. Uh, where she now normally resides and where visitors are very welcome. Uh, you can get the contact details um, uh, on the Alranati website as well as her uh, Milton Huim. It's quite a mouthful, M-I-L-N-T-U-I-M. So you will be always very welcome to join her then. So this evening's class, um, where we have over 45 participants, um, we'll start off with uh, some chanting in, in Pali. Um, we have a great support team in place this evening, um, apart from myself, doing a sort of uh, you know, master of ceremonies perhaps, MC, I'm not sure what time to give myself. And um, we also have uh, Marlon, who's dealing with the technical side, and we also have Amina, who uh, will be fielding questions at the end, and will also be actually acting on our behalf, acting as our spokesperson in the uh, in the requesting of the precepts and the refuges and as a respondent to the in the chanting with Achan Chandasiri. So Marlon will be showing the text of the actual chanting book as and when we get to each part of it. But uh, we will start with the chanting uh, led by Achan Chandasiri, uh, following which he will give offer some reflections after we've taken the three refuges and five precepts. And then there'll be some, hopefully, some time for some questions and answers. Um, the chanting will be in Pali, but I'm sure Ajahn Chandasiri will happily explain how and why she wants to run things. So I'll hand over to Ajahn Chandasiri. Sister, it's all yours. Thank you. It's, it's very nice for me to be here, to have this opportunity to, to practice together. I'm actually in Scotland right now. It's a bit of a grey evening, but quite mild. And I have two uh, companions here who are joining us for the session. Um, you probably won't hear them, but they're, they're here, very much here. And uh, I'll begin actually by lighting the candles and the incense. And you'll see also flowers on the shrine. These are the traditional Buddhist offerings. And then we'll, we'll chant in Pali, uh, part of the evening chanting, not the whole thing. So we'll do the dedication of offerings, we'll do the uh, recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, but we'll miss out the supreme hom homage. Not because we don't feel a sense of supreme homage, but it, it makes it quite long if we do the whole thing. So we'll start off with actually lighting the candles and incense. And of course you're welcome to join in wherever you are, if circumstances permit. And uh, yeah, just feel free to participate to the extent that you're able.
one. Sankor, 
I very much enjoy chanting in the Pali language, and I know that many of you like that too, which was partly why I chose to chant in Pali this evening. Uh, I think when we become familiar with these very simple rituals, uh, it become, can be a great um, source of comfort and also support mindfulness. It's like a kind of active meditation uh, where we, we chant, we bow, and we recollect the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And this is also an important part of the next thing, which is the taking of the five precepts, which I always see as being like the foundation, laying a, a good foundation for our practice. Um, the Buddha taught us that the reason why we suffer is because we don't fully understand the nature of our human existence because we live our, our lives based on all kinds of incorrect assumptions. So meditation is very much about study. It's about observing our own minds and bodies. It's also about training the mind to be present, because if we're not present, we can't really observe anything. <laughs> we live in some kind of um, fantasy world, either projecting into the future, imagining things that are going to happen, Sometimes we imagine difficult, wonderful things uh, and we look forward to them with great excitement. Sometimes we imagine really terrible, really difficult things and we can spend a lot of time dreading or feeling anxious about something that might happen. Um, or we, we spend our time living in our world of memories, um, either regrets, mistakes we've made or those happy, wonderful times when everything was just the way it should be just the way we like it. Um, but neither of these is, is real. These are, all, these, are, these are fabrications of the mind. Uh, a certain amount of forward thinking is helpful. A certain amount of recollecting things that have happened is also helpful. But we tend to do far too much of it. Uh, we haven't cultivated the habit of mindfulness, of presence. This is where meditation comes in. The precepts support uh, mindfulness, they support presence. Because when we live carefully and responsibly according to precepts, our mind can settle relatively easily. We're not carrying a lot of extra baggage around, a lot of extra concerns or fears that, you know, if we've taken advantage of somebody, they might come and take advantage of us. Uh, we're not thinking or planning or scheming to get what we want. Um, but we're more, the mind is more available, it's kind of freed up to be present, so we can actually fully attend to what's happening here, now. So precepts, the five precepts, uh, we always start off with um, going for refuge, um, undertaking to live attuned, aligned with uh, the refuge in the Buddha, that which sees clearly, which knows things as they are, refuge in the Dhamma, the truth uh, that we can only experience in the present moment, here and now. And refuge in the Sangha, uh, the community of those who practice, uh, those people who since the time of the Buddha have applied his teachings, his ways of, of practice 
in their own lives who found benefit and who shared their understanding uh, with others. So throughout the last 2,500, 2,600 years, uh, these teachings have been kept alive through men and women uh, living them, uh, contemplating them, living them in their own lives. So these are very powerful, very secure kind of refuges. And nowadays where everything is constantly shifting and changing, this is a very important thing to have a, a secure basis um, from which to relate to life. So we always start off the refuges and precepts with taking, taking the three refuges. Uh, we do it in Pali three times. And then the five precepts that I'm sure you're familiar with, refraining, undertaking the training, to refraining from taking the life of any living creature, to refrain from taking what's not given, to refrain from sexual misconduct, to refrain from lying, gossiping, uh, harsh, abusive speech, and um, divisive speech and frivolous chit chat, even though it's fun. But we, we um, undertake to uh, reduce the amount of it that we engage in so that our speech is purposeful, useful, encouraging, uplifting. And then the fifth precept, precept which supports all the others, uh, refraining from the use of alcohol and intoxicants so that we keep the mind bright and clear. We're aware and we see things as, in, as undiluted aware as possible. So um, I think that uh, Amina is going to make the formal request for the precepts and then begin with the um, Namotasa and we'll go line by line with the, um, with the refuges and precepts. So this, this is your cue, Amina. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Amahai ti saranena saha pancha silani yacham dutiyam priya maya e ti saranena saha pancha silani yacham tatiyam pi maya maye ti saranena saha pancha silani yacham so I'll reflect like the Namotasa three times, and then you can do it three times, and then we go line by line. Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sambha Sambhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Uthang saranangga chami. Uthang saranangga chami. Dhammang saranangga chami. Dhammang saranangga chami. Sanghang saranangga chami. Sanghang saranangga chami. Dutiyam pi budham saranangga chami. Dutiyam pi budham saranangga chami. Dutiyam pi dhammang saranangga chami. Dutiyam pi dhammham saranangga chami. Dutiyam pi sangham saranangga chami. Dutiyam pi sangham saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi budham saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi budham saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi dhammang saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi dhammham saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranangga chami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranangga chami. Ye Saranakamana Nititang 
You say, um, um, um. <laughs> Okay, now the precepts. Panaki pata, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody hami. Panaki pata, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adinadana, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody hami. Adinadana, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody hami. Kame sumi chachara, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody ami. Musawada, where of money, seek up a dung, somebody ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Dura Miraya Majapamada Tana Where of Mani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami Sura Miraya Majapamada Tana Where of Mani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha si kapadani si lena sukatinyanti si lena boga sampada si lena nebu tinyanti tasama si langwi sotaye. Sadhu, sadhu. Good. So now it's time for some meditation and just a few reminders and then I shall offer a little bit of guidance. Uh, basically the reminders are uh, to find a, a nice posture so that you're sitting nicely upright um, in a posture that suggests an attitude of alertness and brightness of mind. This is important because now we're going to be attending to this moment. Uh, so we want to be alert and the mind bright and attentive, interested in what we're doing. We're not going to be drifting off into some pleasant, uh, pleasant realm <laughs> or struggling to get something but rather we're cultivating an interest in what's happening here and now. So I'm imagining that for many people, as we begin this meditation, you may find that your minds are quite active. And a lot of people think that meditation is just about making your mind quiet. And I mean, I think that's what we'd all like, but it's not so easy um, to do that if we're always trying to make it quiet, trying to exclude things that we think shouldn't be there. Uh, what's much more effective as a strategy in meditation is to learn how to cultivate an attitude of peaceful attentiveness to how things are. Usually I suggest focusing on the breath. That's the, the, the object that the Buddha recommended as a focus for meditation. And it's helpful for, for different reasons, partly because it's quite a, a dynamic process it might not seem all that dynamic, but it's it, but having breathed in, we breathe out again, and then we breathe in again. So there's, there's things happening. It, it, it's, it's changing. There's a movement there that we can be aware of. Um, it's also rather a pleasant, calming experience uh, for most people. Um, 
if you suffer from very bad asthma or breathing difficulties, then you may find it somewhat stressful, in which case I would encourage you to focus more on, on the hands. They're another very sensitive area of the body. And so that can be a good alternative if you find the breathing meditation uh, stressful or difficult. But for most people, focusing on the breath is, is, is a useful um, practice. Um, and it's something you can do any time throughout the day, bringing the awareness to the breath. So I'm going to shift into a, a cross-legged posture and then I'll offer a, a guided, guided meditation. <clears throat> so as I said, we begin by establishing a nicely upright posture. So the head held up just as if you have your eyes open so that you're looking straight ahead rather than allowing it to fall forward, uh, which can very easily lead into a drowsy state. Um, so as far as possible, we, we try to keep the head held up. And of course, you can close your eyes if you prefer. Um, but if you like sitting with your eyes open, that's fine. And if you're feeling very drowsy, very sleepy, then it's extremely helpful to just open the eyes wide. Even if it's the last thing you want to do, uh, just try it. Try to open the eyes if you're feeling sleepy. So for this period of time, we're going to direct the awareness inwards. We're going to attend to our moment by moment experience. And we experience through the body, through the body, the senses, so first of all, just bringing the awareness into the body, just noticing sensations in the body. Noticing the sensation of where we're sitting, sitting on a chair or on the floor, the mat or the cushion, just aware of a feeling of pressure. Bring awareness to that. Just like the base, like the foundation. And then we're aware of the trunk of the body rising up from the base. The trunk of the body that contains the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the guts, and all kinds of very important organs are contained within the trunk of the body. But from the outside, it just looks like a, a solid thing rising up from the base, like the trunk of a tree. So we're aware of the trunk of the body rising up. I always notice my shoulders sticking out at the top. And then the neck. And then the head perched on the top. Something I find helpful sometimes is just to put my hand on the top of the head the crown of the head. And just imagine that you can push up through the crown of the head, lengthening the spine a little bit. So there's a, really a feeling of, of lovely energy in the body. It's alive, it's vital. Next, we take the awareness around the body releasing tension from the different parts of the body. This can be very helpful because often during the day, we accumulate tension in different parts of the body because life for most of us is quite stressful. So it can be helpful at the beginning of a period of practice to take the awareness around the body <clears throat> Breathing through the different muscles, releasing the tension. It's almost as though you're, um, there's a lovely warm or cool, depending on, on which you prefer, 
the, the, the breath is like a cool energy washing through the different muscles. Just purifying, releasing, washing through the tension, washing away the tension. So I often like to breathe in through the heart center and then just direct the awareness to the different parts of the body. I usually begin with the head, the muscles of the scalp. And as I do this, I'm first of all aware that the scalp can be quite tight and that I can gently breathe away that feeling of tightness. Actually experience a sense of softening. So that the skin begins to feel loose against the scalp, against the skull. Similarly with the face, we release tension from the forehead and around the eyes, the cheeks, the mouth. And just feeling the face, the muscles of the face loosen, slacken. So that the face has no particular expression. For a while we can let go of any concerns about what the face looks like. Just let it rest. The front part of the head. Coming round to the shoulder area. We breathe through the muscles around the shoulders, letting them drop. Noticing the weight of the arms and breathing down through the upper arms, the forearms, the wrists, the palms, the fingers. Letting the hands rest loosely on the knees or on the lap, whatever's most comfortable. If you're going to use your hands as a focus for awareness, you can turn the palms upwards, just noticing the sensations in the palms. Coming now to the chest area, to the heart center. Gently breathing through, allowing a softening, an opening of the heart center. We come now to the solar plexus, the middle part of the body. And this is where if there's any sense of stress or agitation or anger or fear or even excitement, we can experience a, a fluttery feeling or a tight feeling in the solar plexus. So we take time to notice how that is, to breathe through allowing us settling. Coming now down into the belly, into the lower abdomen. And for this, I like to encourage a long, deep, wonderful breath in. And then a long, deep, wonderful breath out, releasing through the whole body. Doing this two or three times, allowing it to bring about a sense of deep ease and well being. Taking time to breathe in, taking time to breathe out.
breathing down through the legs, the thighs, the muscles around the knees, the calves, ankles, feet. Allowing the breath to sweep down through the legs, releasing any tension, relaxing. Releasing any pain or tight feelings around the knees, especially. Coming now to the back part of the body. Releasing tension from around the spine. Starting up at the base of the skull and gently working down, breathing through the muscles around the neck area, the bones in the neck. Releasing tension from the back of the shoulder area and the chest area. Back of the rib cage, the waist area, right down to the base of the spine. Observe the back is nicely, gently curved according to its natural, natural shape, but upright. So there's an attitude of alertness, poise, balance, and a sense of ease, a sense of deep bodily well-being and ease. And we continue to be aware of the breath, noticing how it happens, noticing the expansion of the chest cavity that allows the air to flow into the lungs. With a slight pause, and then we notice the air compressed out, the out breath. And we can be aware of that from the beginning of the out breath the end of the out breath. And then it's time to breathe in again. And this is something that the body does by itself throughout our lives. Adjusting, adapting, depending on what's needed. And for this period of meditation, we're going to attend to it. We're going to breathe consciously fully aware of the in-breath as it happens, fully aware of the slight pause between the in and the out-breath, fully aware of the out-breath as it happens, and then another pause before the next in-breath. If you find it helpful, using a word or a phrase to support that full awareness. It can be the mantra, buddho, bud as you breathe in, do as you breathe out. Or some other word or phrase that is meaningful to you. leaving any thoughts that might try to intrude into the mind, leaving them to one side, attending to the breath, consciously using a word or a phrase to occupy the mind, to support the mind in this present moment awareness. not allowing the mind to wander off after some fascinating thought or plan or memory. Just keeping focused with the breath. And if at any time during the meditation, you become aware that you're no longer present, that the mind has taken you to some far off place, 
or some long distant time in the past or in the future, simply recognize, okay, this is what's happened. There could be a moment of marveling at the mind's capacity to do that. And come back. Come back, bring the mind back with firmness and kindness. Coming back again and again with infinite patience. Always willing to come back to this moment, this breath. For some of you, you may prefer to have the main focus with your hands. Just noticing the sensations in the hands. They too are constantly changing. It's a subtle kind of awareness. And it becomes quite interesting when we do this in a focused, conscious way. So the breath the hands as we experience them here, now. It can be helpful to check on your face from time to time because when there's a lot of thinking happening the forehead can become quite tight often just relaxing the forehead softening the face helps us to re-establish presence We call this the soft face practice.
So for the last few moments, I suggest you spend a little bit of time directing thoughts of kindness towards yourself. And often we're far too harsh and judgmental with ourselves about everything, including our meditation. So taking a few moments just to internally find words, may this being be well, or may I be well. Some word or phrase to calm and settle and encourage yourself. And having filled your own being with this kindly energy, you can allow it to extend outwards from the heart center, to extend to those we live with and to our dear ones, wherever they are. To extend to those beings that we know good friends, acquaintances who are sick or suffering some kind of mental anguish or difficulty in their lives. With this heart of kindness, may they be well, may they be liberated from all dukkha, all suffering, all stress. And extending gradually out over the entire planet, all beings everywhere. Those who are living at ease, those who are living with great difficulty, great suffering, great torment, great confusion. This heart of kindness. May they find inner ease and well-being wherever they are, whatever their situation. Allowing a settling of all the fear, all the hatred, all the confusion, the greed. All beings everywhere be liberated, free from every kind of dukkha, every kind of suffering. And for a moment, just extending as far as you can possibly imagine out into the universe. The beings we know about, the beings we don't know about. May they be well. And little by little, withdrawing the awareness, bringing the awareness back to this body sitting here, breathing. May I be well. Thank you.
I'd like to um, offer a short Dhamma reflection now. And I'll also try to make sure that there's time for any questions that you may have. I thought I'd share um, a sutta that I, that I like very much, or rather part of a sutta. It's one that occurs in the uh, Sutta Nipata that some of you may be familiar with, which is quite a short collection of, of teachings. And they're supposed to be some of the very earliest teachings that the Buddha gave, or that were recorded of the Buddha's teachings. And uh, the particular sutta I'd like to, to talk about, the story I'd like to talk about, is the story of Alawaka, who was a very unpleasant <laughs> yaka, who lived in a, a cave, I think, or a, some kind of dwelling at a place called Alavi, uh, which I think was quite close to the banks of the Ganges. Could be wrong about that. Anyway. As the story goes, the Buddha was, he'd been wandering and he came to this dwelling and he didn't realize it was this Yaka's dwelling place. And so he went in and uh, made himself comfortable for the night. And in a very short time, the Yaka came and said, get out. And so the Buddha said, okay, and got up and went out. And so he went out and then the, the Yaka said, come in, come back in again. And the Buddha said, oh, well, okay, I'll come back in again. Very good friend, I'll come back in again. Came back in, settled himself, and then same thing happened again. This great, ugly, awful being, this Yaka said, get out, recluse, get out. And so again, the Buddha said, very good friend, and got up and left. Uh, and again, the same thing happened. Come in again. And so he came in again. And this happened two or three times. And the Buddha was extremely patient and then realized that uh, this uh, wasn't really bringing a very fortunate result. That the, the Yaka was just playing with him. And eventually he said to him, now look, um, it's actually cut from quite how the story goes. He said, no, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. And the Yaka said, well, in that case, I'm going to ask you a question. And if you can't answer my question, I'm going to split your head into seven pieces or I'll throw you across the river. And the Buddha said, well, I don't think you could do that, but you can certainly ask a question. Ask away. What, what's your question? And so the, the Yaka asked these four questions, first of all. So the first question was, what's the best wealth that a human being can have? And the second question was, what way of living brings the most happiness? And the third question was, what's the sweetest of all tastes? And the fourth question was, what's the noblest way to live? So I wonder how you would answer these questions. What the Buddha said was interesting, and it's a teaching I, I often reflect on. So the answer to the first question about the best wealth, it wasn't about having a million or a billion or a trillion pounds in the bank, or about having the biggest diamond you could possibly have, or the biggest house or the best house or the most wonderful swimming pool or any of these things. Um, it was confidence or faith, sadha. 
interestingly, some of you may have come across a similar uh, phrase and where the Buddha talks about contentment being the best wealth. And I'm interested that he had two uh, different things that he described as having been the best wealth. Uh, in some ways I can see how contentment is, but to, to, I think well, let's take some time to reflect on confidence. Sadha. How, how, how is that the best wealth? How is it that the Buddha places such importance on sadha? It's interesting in, in the um, Vinaya discourses, you know, sometimes a monk or a nun would uh, do something really foolish and unsuitable. And over and over again, the Buddha's retort is, you foolish monk, you foolish nun, this is not for arousing faith in people who don't have faith. It's not for increasing faith in people who do have a little bit of faith. Rather, it harms the faith of those who are faithful. Over and over again, you find that in the, in the Vinaya uh, teachings. If you don't have faith in something, then you don't bother with it, do you? Like all of you have um, come to the class this evening because you had faith that this was going to bring, bring benefit. All of you started your, your Buddhist practice, I imagine, because you had faith that it would bring benefit to you. You, 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 you believed that it would be a good thing to do. It was confidence. So faith is what actually gives us the impetus uh, to begin our practice. We also need to uh, sustain, to enhance our faith. And so uh, seeking out other people who are practicing in this way, seeking out people who've maybe been practicing a bit longer, you know, so you can actually see the, the benefits the blessings of the practice, the results of the practice, that can further uh, bring a sense of, of faith, more enthusiasm to, to practice some more, and keep putting energy, keep putting effort into the practice. As we begin to experience the, the blessings, the benefits in our own lives, you know, we find that we, we don't get so quickly upset about things, we're able to maintain a sense of inner calm and balance, just a little bit better. Um, maybe other people say how, how we've changed in a good way. That too can, can support, can enhance our faith, our confidence. Without faith, we, we don't really have much interest or energy to practice, do we? If we get discouraged, um, it can be very difficult to um, you know, to keep our, our, like our daily meditation practice going. Um, we can easily get discouraged. And so you can see that actually this, this faith, this confidence is a very, very significant resource for us. Uh, in fact, the Buddha describes it as one of the, one of the spiritual faculties, the first spiritual faculty. And if you don't have faith, you, you, you don't bother. There's a very interesting uh, teaching, many of you will be familiar with uh, Paticca Samupada, but there's another teaching that maybe you're less familiar with, um, where it goes through the, the different stages of the 12 stages of dependent origination. So that, that teaching starts at ignorance and ends up with suffering. So from ignorance, that's how suffering arises. But then from suffering, you lead step by step to, to perfect liberation. And the first step is sadha. You know, when we're really suffering, when we're really struggling, and we're looking around for something that's going to help us, and we find something, you know, maybe somebody tells us about Buddhist practice, if we think, ah, oh, maybe I'll try that. Maybe we meet somebody. I remember when I first met Ajahn Sumedho, and just the sort of feeling of, Gosh, here's somebody who seems really happy, really at ease in themselves. And immediately I was interested. You know, I wanted to practice. I wanted to know what the secret was. 
you know, how, how he got to be the way he was. And uh, so I was very interested. So I attended to the teachings. I listened. I went on retreat. You know, little by little through doing that and ex beginning to experience the benefits for myself, that gave me the faith to continue. And so I still have faith. I still have faith that this is actually the very best thing I can be doing with my life. And so I continue. Um, so that's the answer to the first question, that faith is, is the, the best wealth. The faith to practice, the faith that liberation is possible for each one of us. And that, can gives, us, that gives us the energy to do the work, to do what's required to give up certain things that maybe we really like, to change our ways of behaving, begin to live according to the precepts, you know, that we might not have considered to be important at all prior to, prior to this time. And as our faith grows, our joy grows. And then that too um, supports well-being, supports us in our practice. So I could talk a lot about faith, but I'm realizing I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to go on to the next one. What, what brings the most happiness? What brings the most happiness, according to the Buddha, is living according to Dhamma. Living uh, with mindfulness, living with, um, uh, in the present moment, uh, put, making that the most important thing in our lives. You know, recognizing the need to plan to make arrangements when we have to go and see somebody else, or um, you know, there does need to be a little planning, a little bit of planning. But our main focus is what's happening here and now. When we think about the future, well, we tend to worry, don't we? Are things going to work out? Is it going to be all right? You know, and there's a huge amount to worry about right now. So, I suggest that you set aside those worries and concerns. And how is it right now? You know, take refuge in the Dharma, in the truth of this moment. This is where we find true happiness, true peace. Of course, if we make a mistake, it can be helpful to reflect on what happened and maybe how we might do things differently next time. You know, that can be helpful, taking the mind deliberately uh, to the memory of some event but we do it consciously, deliberately, rather than allowing ourselves to be constantly pulled back into the past. You know, some kind of fascination that draws us back again and again. Instead, we come to the present. Again, I could talk a lot more about that, but the next one, uh, what, what is the sweetest of more taste? Uh, what, what is the sweetest of all tastes? And the Buddha's answer to that is truth. Even though it's sometimes uh, painful, sometimes difficult to hear the truth, we don't always want to hear the truth, but when we can fully open to the truth, there's a kind of a sweetness about it. And again, it's about bringing ourselves into contact with Dhamma, the truth of this moment. So it's not always easy or pleasant or what we want, but when we can really uh, stop struggling to try to get away from it, to try to avoid it and just acknowledge it, okay, this is how it is right now. Then there's a sense of the sweetness of truth, the sweetest of all tastes. It's interesting, the Buddha talks about the, um, the Dhamma, which is in a way the same as the truth, the truth of this moment, uh, to be experienced individually by the wise and often Ajahn Chah would talk about the taste of honey, you know, that it's a very sweet taste, but unless you actually taste it, you don't know that. So in the same way, um, the taste of truth is the sweetest of all tastes. And then the fourth one, what is the noblest way to live? What is the best, noblest way to live? And the answer to that is living with wisdom, with wisdom, with understanding. So having, having right view, right understanding. You know, why, why do we suffer? 
It's not because of what's happening out there. It's because of what's happening in here. It's because of our attitude to the things that happen around us. And when we're really able to acknowledge that, to see that, then we have the, the, uh, the clue as to how to end the suffering in our lives. So the Buddha talked about the no, Four Noble Truths uh, that require a kind of um, integrity, a kind of courage, faith. So I find that this answer to the Buddha's, to the, to the, to the Yaka's questions that the Buddha gave, uh, full of things for us to contemplate. So confidence is the best wealth. Uh, living according to Dhamma brings the most happiness. Truth is the sweetest of all tastes. And living with wisdom is the noblest way to live. So I'm going to end this reflection now. And I offer it for your reflection, for your contemplation. And I hope it will uh, support you on your journey to liberation. And now if you have, if there are any questions, I'm happy to spend a little bit of time uh, trying to answer them. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Sister. Very inspiring Dhamma talk. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, as I said, there are two ways of asking them. You can either put them into the chat box as a written question or if you uh, raise your hand or highlight your interests, uh, then you can ask directly and unmute yourself and, and ask the question. I don't know if we have any questions in the chat box, probably we're sort of, sort of absorbed in the digesting uh, the reflections. Uh, there's one question by chat. Oh, and um, now a second, but I'll give the first one. Um, yes. You mentioned that in some suttas, the Buddha said the greatest wealth is faith, and in others, that the greatest wealth is contentment. Do you have any thoughts on why the Buddha gave these different answers? Is there any link between, or is there a link, sorry, between faith and contentment? Okay. Um... I have never thought about whether there's a link between faith and contentment, other than the fact that the Buddha spoke about both of them as being uh, the greatest wealth. Um, the Buddha, I mean, he, he taught for 45 years, and so he, he gave an enormous number of teachings to different people on different occasions. And... Um, I can't possibly second guess the Buddha as to why he um, sort of would give different answers to this question on different occasions. Um, I've said a little bit about why, how I see that he would have, or why I think he, he would have chosen uh, faith as the best wealth. As far as um, uh, contentment, uh, it doesn't take terribly much contemplation, or maybe it does. Anyway, if we're content with what we have, there's a feeling, we're not always wanting, the worst thing actually, let's just put it this, the other way around, the worst thing I think in life is when people never have enough. They always want more. And Ajahn Amaro tells a story of some fabulously wealthy man, I can't remember who it was, he quotes him as when he was asked, you know, how, you know, how much will actually be enough? <laughs> you know, when will you have enough? And his answer was, when I have a little bit more than I have now. So this constant wanting more. And I think we can all of us see that in our own lives. You know, the, the tendency to always be wanting more and better. Uh, whereas when we can actually just be content with what we have, you know, it's good enough, it's fine. Then there's a, such a sense of, then we stop looking, we stop yearning and, and wanting more. It's very bad news for the advertisers because they, they, they work by 
stimulating a sense of uh, not being content. You know, you must have this latest, bestest thing uh, in order to be a completely, fully happy person. If you haven't got this, then you're definitely lacking in some way. You must have more. And so people are, are primed to always be wanting more, never feeling that they have enough. And this is an absolute tragedy. It's, it's really, it's a disaster, really, and a complete disaster for the planet because, you know, consumerism has got completely out of hand. Whereas, like, the monastic life is, is good news because we're encouraged to be content with having something to wear, you know, something just to cover the body. It doesn't have to be the latest fashion. This fashion goes back 2,500 years, and it's completely fine covers the body. I'm reasonably modest most of the time. I'm warm enough. That's what we need. Something to keep us warm, modest, reasonably comfortable. Uh, some kind of food. Doesn't have to be the best, the most wonderful. Um, I mean, people do offer me the most wonderful food, but it doesn't have to be. So my training is to be content with what's offered. Some kind of shelter, uh, some kind of medicine. So the training is to be content with what we have. And if, you, if something is broken, we mend it. I'm forever mending my socks, <laughs> always, always full of holes. So we just mend things if they're broken, if they're damaged, rather than feeling we've got to have a whole stack, more and more things. So um, you can see why contentment is a very important um, aspect to, to contemplate. Uh, in our lives. It's not meaning that we have to have the worst of everything. It doesn't mean that it's not okay to have something new and something bright and shiny and wonderful, but um, to be content with what it, what it is that we have. And also to consider, well, can I share this? Can I give it away to somebody else? You know, the world would be, you know, there's plenty for everybody in the world, but um, uh, we haven't actually learned how to share what we have because we always feel we need more. So contentment is a very important thing for us to contemplate. So both things, contentment, confidence, they're both good things. So I hope that sort of answers the question. Uh, there are a few more that have come. Um, so the next one is, was the yucca able to benefit from the advice? I'm sure he was. I can't actually remember how. Yes, in fact, he is. Yeah. That's right. I think by the end of the sutta, he, he becomes one of the Buddha's disciples. Um, so he definitely benefits. Um, I think that's what happens. I don't, I don't think he got to full enlightenment at that point, but I think he, um, he, he was able to pay respects to the Buddha and he, he really uh, admired the Buddha. He, he, having been quite dismissive of him and extremely rude and, and, and disrespectful. By the end, he was um, much more respectful and uh, appreciative of the Buddha's teaching. <laughs> okay, uh, the next one is, I am new to practicing Buddhism with only one year's practice researching the basic principles. How can I begin to further my practice and learning? Ah, so um, I always encourage people to get into the habit of meditating every day. Um, it doesn't have to be for a long, long time, but you know, 10 minutes at a time that works for you. So it's not that you have to get up incredibly early in the morning, but you know, find a time during the day which works for you. Try to stick with the same time each day. I often suggest to do it for a week because that way you begin to develop the habit and um, just do it every day. Whether your mind actually calms down very much or not, um, it's really good just to spend time um, noticing how things are for you, being present with things as they are. It's a little bit like getting to know yourself, making friends with yourself in a different way. So that's one thing that's a good thing to do. Um, trying to be present throughout the day, you know, trying to notice what's going on moment by moment. Particularly if you're feeling a little bit upset, a little bit thrown by things. 
you know, often, sometimes people with Buddhist practice, I mean, they, they, they read the scriptures and they think, well, I, I, must, I mustn't be attached. I must be um, equanimous, equanimity, upeka. I must be very equanimous and not, not, not mind about things. I have to be perfectly uh, serene and dispassionate. <laughs> and you sort of pluck these words out of the scriptures and you can get yourself tied up into a real knot because these are things that arise uh, as we come to terms with the, the lack of calm, with the attachment to things, as we begin to actually study these things, learn about them through our own experience. So you have to see yourself as being like a laboratory. And this, this, is, this is what, we, what, what we're studying. In. This is what we're taking an interest in. This is how we're learning about suffering, strangely enough. You know, it's not, you don't learn about suffering just through reading about it, I assure you. So reading about it is helpful. You hear the teachings, it's like a pointer saying, look here. So I'm saying to you, look, look, study the suffering in your own life. That's how you learn. Uh, when, you, when you can actually be present with the suffering, fully present, no longer struggling, trying to make things otherwise, then you experience, maybe just for a moment, the release from suffering. A feeling of peace and the, the, oh, I don't need to worry about that. It's okay. And then just cultivating the path. So it's a very much a kind of hands-on kind of practice. Uh, and we use every little experience that happens to us. You know, the time that we make a mistake, the time that we, we do something foolish, just noticing what happens in the mind at that point. You know, can you pick yourself up? Can you just begin again? Um, can you contemplate change? Can you notice how change happens? Uh, so the Buddha spoke about the three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta. And these are things we learn about through observation, not up here, but through observation in our own experience. Noticing change, noticing a struggle in the mind, noticing the way that the self arises. I mean, you could be walking along feeling everything's absolutely fine. I've, I've managed to, I've, I've cracked the self. I don't have any self anymore. I'm absolutely fine. And then somebody insults you. Then you notice yourself. Uh, or somebody disagrees with you. Then you notice yourself. You can feel yourself, the, the, the whole, the self actually, that you feel your whole body full of this, full of this sense of self. How dare you? That's the sense of self. So we learn about it through our own experience. Uh, it's not about saying, oh, that person's got a really huge ego. I'm not, I'm not like them. It's actually observing here. So it requires a, a kind of humility, a willingness, a true, a, 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 an honesty to be able to acknowledge what's going on for us. That has to be there. And I have to say for myself, I find a sense of humor is really helpful. And great, great kindness. We have to learn to be kind to ourselves rather than blaming and judging and criticizing when we don't quite live up to the, the high Buddhist ideals uh, that we've set for ourselves. You know, the Buddha taught us, gave us these teachings because he wanted us to be well, to be happy, to enjoy life, not because he wanted us to be miserable and constantly judging and criticizing and blaming ourselves. There's a big difference. So, Learning from life. That's probably the, the most important phrase. Learn from life. You know, your own life, your own experience. Contemplate life as it happens, here and now, whatever it is you're experiencing. Again, I could talk a lot more about that, but maybe there are some other questions. Uh, yeah. We have a little bit more time. Uh, there are two, two more questions. Um, Apart from meditation, what is the best thing to do with, or, or I, I think our spare time? Um, we can read the suttas, but what else is best to concentrate on? Thank you. Oli, you know what came into my mind as you were speaking? What came into my mind was, enjoy yourself. <laughs> uh, so... It's a matter of noticing what's needed, uh, 
moment by moment. And sometimes uh, what's needed is to attend to some particular task. You know, if you've got some spare time, maybe you need to mend your socks. Maybe you need to um, uh, contact somebody that you uh, know and are concerned about or that you haven't seen for a long time. Uh, maybe you need to go for a walk in nature and, and just enjoy the fresh air, enjoy just looking at the trees, um, noticing the birds, uh, just noticing, noticing the countryside, noticing nature. And sometimes that's a, a really, really good thing to do, particularly if you're feeling a little bit unhappy or confused or upset about something. Sometimes you need to have a, a deep bath with lots of bath essence <laughs> and really relax. Uh, study can be helpful if, if you're interested in that. Uh, picking up a, a, a book of scriptures and just dipping into it. Um, sometimes reading other things can be helpful. Reading, reading about other people's inspiring lives or experiences. So there's, there's many, many different uh, ways that we can spend our time. And it, it doesn't all have to be sort of, uh, shall we say, quote unquote, you know, Buddhist practice. Uh, I mean, we can just make the whole of our life our practice because what's, what's important is, is mindfulness, that we're aware, that we stay in touch uh, with our own minds and bodies, that we notice what's going on for us. So that's the most important thing. There's a sutta that we, we, that we chanted it this morning, the Padekarata Sutta, where the Buddha says, you know, don't, don't worry about the future or the past, but it's in the present moment to observe what's going on moment by moment. So we can do this in formal meditation, of course. That's a, a good thing to do. But we can do it every moment of our life. You know, if we're chopping wood or going for a walk or you know, preparing a meal or eating a meal, um, or washing up after the meal, you know, we can we can be present every moment, uh, not as a huge difficult task, but more that's the natural place for the mind to be, <laughs> you know, just to, to, to do what we're doing when we're doing it. Uh, we've got into a habit of not being present, but the encouragement in Buddhist practice is is to cultivate the habit of being present, whatever we're doing. I strongly recommend not breaking the precepts, of course, and so not deliberately harming anyone or any creature, not deliberately stealing or taking what doesn't belong to you or sexual misconduct or lying or gossiping or harsh speech or intoxicants. I don't you know. Those are, those are ways that I would say, well, not so skillful ways of using our time. But um, other things, yes, there's, there's, there's plenty we can, we can do and still be practicing as Buddhists. I hope that answers the question in a sort of a way. Um, thank you very much, sister. That was my question and that was a helpful answer. The, I don't, yeah. I would like to say was I spend too much time reading. I'm devoted to books. Now well, some of the reading is quantum mechanics, which is useful to understand the world. But sometimes I read novels and I pretend that it's to make me empathetic with other people. But do you think novel reading is acceptable? I think it can be very acceptable. It can be very relaxing, very pleasant. Um, it, it does, can give insight into um, different ways of living and different characters. It can be inspiring. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you have to notice for yourself the effect on your mind. Yeah. You know, I find there are some things I read, like sometimes if I read the newspaper, I can only take a little bit because then I actually feel I, I don't like the effect on my mind. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a matter of, you know, cultivating discernment. So you actually observe, you learn, you know, you notice the results of the things that you do. Um, you know, there are certain useful guidelines, like the precepts are like useful guidelines, you know, it's better not to do that, but this can be a helpful thing. But according to your character, according to your interest, 
Uh, there are all kinds of things that you can you can read. Um, so knowing your intention a little bit when you're reading, you know, is it just because you you don't want to do something else, or is it something that you you know you actively are interested in and enjoy? There needn't be any harm in that. Right. So notice that, you notice that, you know that you're getting confused and upset and you know that it's it's bringing up you know unhelpful mind states then probably that particular novel or whatever it is might not be the best thing maybe it's better just to put that one to, to one side or chuck it in the fire or throw it into the ocean or give it to a charity shop for someone else so discernment yeah Right. Should we take that one more question that you've got, Mina? You said you had one more question. Yes, there's one more question. Yeah. Okay, let's do one more. If, if that's all right with everybody else, and if, yes. if it's not, you're welcome to to vote with your feet and leave. Okay. Um, it is as a young person, I find it difficult to stay away from materialistic aims and endlessly scrolling through social media. Any advice on breaking this habit? Yes, um, try, fast, try fasting days. So have a day without turning on your mobile phone, put it in a drawer for a day. And if that seems like too much, maybe for a couple of hours, that's, that's a very helpful uh, strategy and, and very simple. And you'll find that the world doesn't fall apart when you, uh, don't um, look at your messages. You know, life actually goes on completely fine most of the time without uh, constantly involving yourself in that way. Um, I think there's a huge pressure because, I mean, that's what everybody does, I'm told. Um, but if you, once you start having little fasting times or fasting days, what you then notice the result of that, notice the effect of that. And I'm imagining that actually you'll, 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 you'll enjoy the effect of that. You'll enjoy the effect on your mind of not constantly stimulating it in that way. And you may find that your meditation happens more easily as well. You know, not, not, not constantly being uh, stimulated. So, that's certainly one thing I would recommend. Tr just try going without and really noticing the effects of that. You can also notice the resistance to that. You know, sometimes when somebody suggests something like that, you think, oh, I'm not going to do that. Well, just try it. You know, even just, you know, for a short time. If, if two hours seems like too much, well, try half an hour. Uh, I don't know how, 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 how um, entrenched your habit is, but that's, you, you have to know for yourself what, what, what's manageable and what might be helpful. Um, but that's the best way of breaking a habit, is to introduce another habit. I have a habit of not turning on the computer. Um, I try and do it twice a week, on Sundays and on our observance days. And at least when I, when I do turn it on, on those days, it, it, you know, I have to think, well, do I really, 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 really need to send that message? And often the answer is yes. And so I send the message and then I turn it off again quickly. And I, I so enjoy the effect on my mind of, of doing that. So a media fast from time to time, TV fast, uh, newspaper fast, whatever, whatever you, know, you, you use as a, a way of finding out about the world. And um, rather than finding out through the media, find out through direct experience, uh, which doesn't require a mobile phone or a television set or, or anything else. Just a, a body and a mind and, and, and the senses. Well, Sister, thank you very much for that great advice. Um, looking at the time, I think it might be um, an opportunity to start winding down. And I just wanted if you wanted to do a chant at all from uh, the chanting book or did you want to go straight through to the closing homage or say a few closing words i don't know how about if we chant the buddha's um uh what is it reflections on universal well-being may i abide in well-being which you'll find on page 
uh, for, 41, I think, in yes, the book. In, in English, we'll do it. Yes, very well. And this is a very nice one just to carry in the mind, particularly the first four or five lines. I find it a very useful contemplation. So we'll chant that, and then after that, I'll turn to the shrine and we'll do the closing homage, if that seems like a good way to do it. Very well, thank you very much. Well, that sounds fine. And uh, we'll all be muted now whilst you chant, and we can join in the privacy of our particular environment. Okay. Now let us chant the reflection on universal well being. May I abide in well being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety. And may I maintain well-being in myself. May everyone abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety. And may they maintain well-being in themselves. May all beings be released from all suffering. And may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are the owners of their action and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action, and its results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such acts they will be the heirs. We'll do the closing homage in Pali. So I cut Well, sis, I'd like to thank you again very much for joining us and for leading this evening's inspiring class uh, on behalf of everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing you again. Uh, we have our next term, I think is the next time we'll see you. So we'll have to be patient, practice patience <laughs> and contentment with what we've got uh, and look forward to seeing you in the future. Um, I just like to say a few words, uh, just to mention that next week, Ajahn Tisara will be joining us. Uh, so she'll be taking the class next week. And then we have three classes after that, which take us up to the end of June or the third, the third week of, sorry, of July. And then we'll have a, a summer break. 
I'm not quite sure how long these breaks are going to carry on happening because, of course, with the internet now, um, the physical side of life has changed a little bit and we can just tune in when we need to. I have no idea what the Buddhist society plans in terms of classes during the summer, uh, summer holiday, as it were. But, of course, Dhamma is always... Uh, present and practice is always present so whether we have a break from these classes or not our practice continues. Uh, I'd like to thank very much, I'd like to thank Marlon for operating behind the scenes and putting the texts up for us. I'd like to thank Amina for fielding the questions and passing them on and I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us and wish everybody well. So thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.